Hey, everybody. Welcome to this session. My name is Gina Miranda Samuels. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm going to turn my camera off in a moment, but I just wanted to have this minute to say hello to you. Behind me, you'll see my fake background. That's really my cabin, but I'm not there. I'm in Chicago wishing that I was there. So I'm going to turn my camera off and get started on this asynchronous slide. I am going to make these available. Um, but I am throughout the slides going to ask you to stop and pause them for a moment and just think about or reflect on something that I might be saying. So just be, uh, be aware of that. Okay. So part of the reason why I thought this might be an important topic to, for us to talk about, particularly for us as uh, researchers and for those of you who are um, in the moment of beginning your research career is that I think a lot of folks come to qualitative work in particular um, and, in, and especially in adoption come to a qualitative work because of the value that qualitative traditions place on first voice accounts, insider wisdom, um, which can oftentimes be very effective method for disrupting the force of dominant systems of meaning like about race, about family, love, kinship, belonging, or what's required for healthy development. But researchers using qualitative methods aren't immune to actually oppressing the very voices they seek in privileging dominant knowledges, theories, at nearly every stage of the research process. So I'm going to be inviting us to think together to consider how rigorous critical qualitative methods might be useful, or at least one way, of advancing socially just knowledge development that engages rather than suppresses the complexity and diversity of those who do family, race, and identity work through adoption. And while my presentation today is mostly going to focus on or exclusively focus on qualitative methods, I do want to just let those of you who might be using mixed methods or who even might be using qu strictly quantitative methods, that there's a whole tradition in quantitative, um, a young tradition in quantitative scholarship called quant crit. And I would encourage those of you who are wanting to bring a critical lens to quantitative work to, to check that out. So in our live session, we're going to think together across various moments of research, how we might want to engage research at what stage, <clears throat> excuse me, in order to disrupt some of the cycles of repression. This video, think about it like a warm up time that we're going to have together so that we have a shared foundational understanding. Also, I just want to draw your attention. A lot of what I'm going to be talking about assumes that you have read epistemic trauma and transracial adoption and the other writing about extended case method, which is an example of bringing a critical method to um, qualitative research on adoption and specifically transracial adoption. But I also have provided um, citations for some supplemental reading that some of you who aren't especially familiar with critical methods might find useful. And so um, these slides will be available for you to be able to, to do searches for the, those literatures. So this video, we're going to cover what is epistemic injustice as a foundation to why critical uh, methods? How does that relate to adoption and research on adoption? What makes a study critical? What does that even really mean? And how we might we together reimagine a critical research agenda in adoption? And I'm going to go through some of the areas where we might do that, but I really want to spend our time together live to, to think that through as a group. Please be sure as you're watching this video to also write out your questions. I'll provide time at the beginning of our live session to engage some questions. Um, I I want to also be sure that we have time to, to use the hour fully, but I do want to make sure that before we get uh, dig into what we're going to be doing during our live time, that everybody's on the same page or at least has your questions uh, written out. So grab some paper, pencil, or um, don't be old fashioned and use your computer and write out the questions that you have along the way. So first, what is epistemic injustice? It's a very fancy word um, that really just sort of means harm that happens to people and communities credibility as knowers based on identity prejudice. And you can think of all kinds of examples and we'll talk a little bit about some of them. 
But you can think of all kinds of examples where when we listen to somebody, we might make a judgment about their credibility. And sometimes that's okay. There are some people that may not be in a position to be able to speak to or speak about a particular phenomenon, experience, or event. But a lot of times what's operating are our judgments coming from identity prejudices. In the field of epistemic injustice, which largely comes out of philosophy, there are two kinds of epistemic injustice. One is what happens when we're speaking, so a testimonial injustice around speech, expression, or the content of what someone is saying. A second kind of epistemic injustice involves meaning making and interpretation, and we call that hermeneutical injustice. When we think about testimonial injustice, the wrong committed against a person when their claims are dismissed as a result of identity prejudice, it could be because we don't listen to a child because of adultism. And we were thinking that a child doesn't, isn't a credible knower and doesn't have the developmental capacity to speak or have opinions or be taken as a credible knower. Or it could be perhaps because of their race or their race and their gender, or it could be because of their gender presentation or their sexuality. So there's all kinds of ways in which because of how we've come to understand and presume people and the skin they're in or what they embody, that we don't believe that they're credible knowers. Think of the perfect example or most recent, one of the most recent examples here is the hashtag Me Too movement or the Black Lives Matter movement. Sometimes people can experience injustice as a result of their meanings. So here it's an identity prejudice discredited, that discredits a person as a meaning maker and in their interpretation of information, an event, or a condition. In the paper I asked you to read, I talked quite a bit about my own experience of hermeneutical justice and what I called hermeneutical smothering, where I, like this guy drowning in the, in the so-called puddle, <laughs> was saying, it's deep, it's harmful, it's bad. And people around me with identity privilege would say, no, no, it's not. So that's a hermeneutical injustice. So what does any of this have to do with adoption or adoption research? Well, in part, it's because research of all kinds, not just adoption research, is oftentimes a hot spot for reinforcing these kinds of hermeneutical and testimonial injustices through how we collect data, and how we listen, and how we disseminate knowledge, and the lenses that we use to filter meanings to as credible or not credible. Research is also a hot spot because we oftentimes reinforce and disrupt these very identity prejudices and injustices that exist in our society and cultures that we bring into our research um, with us, specifically for adoption around doing family and race. So if we think about what are some identity prejudices that actually exist towards adopted persons, and I'm sure what I'm gonna be reviewing here is truly just a review of many things that many of you already know. So there are many ways in which society, um, particularly people who are not adopted, but may have adopted parents included or professionals or researchers, engage knowledge from adopted persons or think about adopted persons in ways that dismiss, marginalize, silence, pathologize, or even tokenize or exotify adopted persons. Think here in terms of the stereotype of the angry adoptee. Once the angry adoptee has been given that identity, she is no longer worthy or credible of being listened to because of her emotion and her anger. Viewing an adopted person as a special or unique or marginalizing them within the family as the adopted son or daughter, et cetera. Infantilizing or adulted views, adultist views of adopted persons, biocentric notions about family that can dismiss relationships as not real or as not natural. For those of us who are mixed race or exist in families where we do not match the races and racial identities of our parents or of our siblings or of our extended family, oftentimes our engagements in our racial ethnic communities of origin are met with you're not X enough, whatever that is. For me, it was I wasn't Black enough, but it could be that you're not Korean enough or Chinese enough or Latine enough or Native enough. And these all come from prejudices that are rooted in monoracist microaggressions. Monoracism just being the presumption that being a single race is superior to being a, uh, two races or more. <clears throat> 
And finally, related prejudices towards adopted persons, family and community and racial, ethnic, cultural origins. So all the ways in which adopted people carry the same stigmas and of their families of origin, their race of origin, their culture of origin, or their nation, nation of origin. Think about many, many others that I haven't linked here. There's also dominant cultural theories or what we might just call stories of adoption that people scripts, right? Narratives that people are exposed to, ourselves included. These include stories about um, that affirm adopted people as needing to be grateful or being lucky or being special, unique or chosen or white supremacist narratives that are about rescuing, right? From lesser or pathologized families, religions, cultures or nations. Sometimes these narratives or stories frame adoption outcomes in terms of binaries of social, solely good or only in terms of gain or solely as bad or in terms of loss. Sometimes these stories render racial and cultural identity development as something that's optional or superficial or external, like equating a healthy cultural or racial identity to the presence of a race label use or books or dolls or culture camp attendance. Or sometimes these narratives leave race and identity and culture up to children to initiate their, uh, their own interest in that. Stories can affirm a race evasive white supremacy. This was very popular and, and remains so, I would argue, um, in terms of projecting transracial adoptive families as rainbow families or um, doing difference in adoptive families through colorblindness or thinking of biraciality as a condition of the best of both worlds. Stories that value assimilation or adoptive parent attachment or white cultural capital as the only markers of success, not to say those aren't or might not be important or as assets, but just to understand them as the only ways in which we might value success. And also the rhetoric of beginnings, which I talk a little bit about in the paper starting the story of adoption or the pairing of trauma, starting the story at adoption or the pairing of trauma with past genetics or past history or something in the past for which the adoptive family and parents are not responsible to or for. Again, these are just some dominant narratives. I'm sure we could and will when we're together think of many more and the ways that these bleed into our research. So I'd like you to take a second here and pause and reflect either on questions that you might have had so far in what I've said, or specifically on what are the stories that you've been told or that you tell about adoption, family, or race? Where do they come from? Maybe they come from movies that you've seen or books that you've read or research that you've read or from your own lived experience of family or race. And what identity and prejudices or identity privileges are operating here? How do these affirm certain characters and certain positionalities within adoption? How do they potentially pathologize? What is said? What is not said? Pause now and do that. It's okay. So now that you're back from thinking about these narratives and societal narratives that find their ways into our own <laughs> minds and hearts and stories and narratives, but also find their way into research and into our engagements with others. So what does knowledge oppression really look like? What does epistemic oppression really look like? And so epistemic oppression can, and injustice can certainly be at the macro level and can certainly um, involve policies and you know large cultural tropes that are part of our structures and aren't necessarily um, live independently of individual people but oftentimes they are enacted interpersonally and they are also enacted in our engagements with people through our research so these are two two moments that you're looking at moment one here is a lemon i'm presuming this uh Pineapple is their therapist, and this lemon is saying, everyone tries to make me into lemonade, but I just can't be something I'm not. And so that goes back to that narrative uh, trope of binaries, right? That 
sometimes in society, um, our society has a hard time holding complexity, both and a story being both uh, full of joy and full of pain. And so this happens oftentimes in adoption where we want only stories of redemption and stories of resilience for adoptees where the trauma ends for us when we are adopted. How we design our research often reenacts those same narratives and force fits people's stories into wanting to only hear about lemonade. <laughs> and so in the second scene here, you, hear, you see a, a person who is engaged, I'm assuming in research, where the person is saying, the way I feel, it's hard to quantify. And then she's saying, how hard? on a scale of one to 10. And so even when we are listening and seeking the voices of people and they are saying that it's both and, I can't even quantify it, we still erect our research in ways that ask them to force fit their experience, their feelings, their lived expertise into existing dominant cultural ways of knowing. And that's a problem. So this sort of knowledge oppression can occur at multiple stages of the research process. And we're gonna talk about a little bit later where critical approaches help us to think more critically about disrupting these moments of oppression. We can think particularly about the method that we choose and using research designs and measures that oftentimes exclude, undermine, or distort the full scope of lived experience. This happens very quickly when we use standardized measures, right? That by the very notion of a standardized measure, it suggests that it is standard and that there is a standard against which everyone else will be responding. Second is oftentimes when we um, don't attune enough to context that um, either our studies don't engage context or we center or assume implicitly a bit one particular context that matters. In my paper, I talked a little bit about how that happened in transracial adoption research where white cultural context and white families were the context that was presumed as mattering the most. And finally, theory. And here I'm talking about both implicit, the theories that maybe go unspoken, but still are driving a lot of assumptions that we bring to our research, and also the explicit theories that we use for our work that oftentimes can distort, obscure um, the view or the lens that we use to interpret findings or establish their significance. And this includes your lens. And we'll talk a little bit later about how in critical research, we very much pay attention to positionality and self-awareness as um, as essential agents for helping us to disrupt oppression and systems of power in our, in our work. So what makes a study method critical anyway? Well, these are some of the um, elements that tend to find their way into um, the work of those of us who would engage a, a specifically or explicitly critical method, though there are other um, ones that certainly many of us who use critical methods would add to this, but these are sort of four core aspects. First, it's an explicit focus on processes of power, oppression, inequity, displacement, marginalization, pathologizing, and I should say, and or colonization. Certainly no study takes up all of these, but it is a, sort of an unabashed politic to one's work where you're focusing on some aspect of these things as present in whatever phenomenon you're interested in. It's an attunement to how knowledge oppression is actually baked into our very research methods and scientific processes and, even, and knowledge practices. It's a rejection of the idea of neutrality and objectivity as even humanly possible or something we should actually want at all. And instead, it's viewed as a tool of protecting privileged statuses. So when one claims ideas of neutrality, oftentimes critical um, Folks taking a critical approach would argue that that's actually in service of protecting power and elite as credible and authorized knower and oftentimes reinforces power differentials rather than undoes them. So neutrality is not necessarily a way of disrupting the, the cycles of oppression that we might be interested in disrupting for our work. And finally, primary purpose of the research is ultimately to be used for social justice, transformation, decolonization, liberation, 
or anti-oppressive change in theory, knowledge, policy, practice. So it's not doing knowledge just for knowledge sake, though that certainly can be social justice to um, pursue knowledge democracy, let's say. But it also is meant to be used for the purpose of liberty, liberation and equality. So what are critical approaches? I think it's important because probably all of you, I'm gonna bet, even though I have not yet met any of you, are being trained as positivists, whether or not that's explicit or um, implicit, that positivism is the dominant um, philosophy of science that all of us are exposed to, myself included. I was trained as a, a positivist and a quantitative scholar in my doctoral program. Um, and, and so it's important to, to note um, this level of epistemology because I think that a lot of folks who find their way to qualitative methods still oftentimes are anchored in more positivist orientations about truth and science. So I just wanna put this out here. And again, none of these are automatically like better or there isn't one that's necessarily evil, but there are some that are more um, attuned and explicit about disrupting oppression, about subjectivity, et cetera. So positivism and positivist approaches, and I would include in here post-positivism, is the belief that there's a single knowable truth and that research is a tool for uncovering generalizable or universal laws and truths about cause and effect of social behavior. All quantitative science engages positivist approaches and positivist philosophies. And some, and I would even argue a good proportion of qualitative work actually engages positivism as its foundational and implicit theory of science. Then there's a body of uh, work that would be called interpretive, constructivist also would oftentimes be in a, a similar umbrella of philosophy of science. And here, truths are understood in context. Many have limited generalizability. Uh, research is a tool for understanding the realities and meaning of people as they are lived by those people in context. Some folks in the interpretive camp are highly relativistic and would say that you can only understand knowledge as it is lived by an individual person in their context. And others of them, of, of folks like myself included, are less relativist and more open to the idea that there are generalizable um, truths that can be understood in context and must be tied to, their, to those contexts. And critical approaches take a similar bent on truths, but are understood in the context of also power, oppression, historical and ongoing. That research is also a tool, as I mentioned earlier, that should be used to improve conditions of the oppressed by expressing or by exposing power inequities, oppressive narratives, and processes. So that means that when we're engaged in qualitative work and we're hearing stories or we're expressing stories or we're recreating stories that people are sharing with us or that communities have articulated with us, that these are never neutral acts. And in some cases, they're highly political acts. And I would argue in the case of adoption, they are always political acts because adoption is such a political enterprise. <clears throat> So the teller always has an agenda, a purpose, a goal. And that is not meant to say that people lie. Um, that's not the, the heuristic that I'm operating in here. It's just that at all times, all of us as people have agendas, want to be heard, want you to hear a particular aspect of my story that is oftentimes discredited. Um, at all times, tellers are operating off of their existing knowledge. That knowledge is incomplete as all people's knowledge is incomplete. Some people have been kept from parts of their story. That is particularly true for adoptive people. And so that's important for us to come to stories from that place of knowing that all of us have incomplete knowledge and many of us who are adopted have incredibly incomplete knowledge and motivations. And so the same is true for the listener. The listener has an agenda. Those of us who are doing research and listening to stories, we have an agenda, a purpose, and a goal for our listening. We too are operating off of existing knowledge that is incomplete. And we also have motivations. And those things come together um, as part of the, the created knowledge and the shared meaning of the story that we that we create in our in our research. And that also is oftentimes a hot spot of where 
meanings also can be silenced, obscured, or distorted based on the tools that we bring to bear as we are collecting information. So being critical should cause us to think about power operating in our research processes, operating in our theories, our methods, and our interpretations. It causes us to ask questions like, who gets to decide what's an important topic? Who gets to decide what's fundable? Who asks and creates the research questions? Is it just you? Is it for those of you who are finishing up your dissertations or engaging on uh, dissertation work? Is it your committee? Is it people who are senior in the field who have asked these questions before? Who designs the study and collects the data? How involved is the community or participants in doing any of these things? Who makes meaning of its results? And how do we determine significance by what gets said the most often? by what's dominant thinking versus what's unique or anomalous or unusual. And who are we producing this research for anyway? Who gets to use it in what form? And whose best interests and needs are served in it? These are all questions that we ask as critical researchers. Being critical means that you do not just design a study or use a method or a measure because of or a theory because that's just how it's done. If that's what you're doing, then that is a, a more traditional way of engaging research. And part of the session is to get us to break outside of that, to ask and think critically about why are we using this measure? Why are we asking this question, et cetera? So in this last part of this video, what I want us to do is just think about four critical moments to practice critical research. There are many, many more, and there are multiple moments that I have smushed into one. And so I'm hoping that during our live session, we'll have time to disentangle some of these and think about them as they might more relate to different moments of the research process that each of you are in. But I've organized them in this way. So first, choosing your topic and crafting research questions. Second, choosing a method and methodology. Third, choosing theories and bringing in lenses of interpretation. And fourth, forms of dissemination. So moment one, choosing a purpose, a topic, and crafting your research questions. This is a really critical moment that ideally is not just done by you alone. Um, there are many, 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 many things to read about participatory action research. And I encourage those of you who are interested in those kinds of methods, which can be credit, some which can be critical and others which are um, more implicitly critical, but not necessarily explicitly critical to think about who's at the table when you are even deciding your topic. Who are you bringing forth? Who are you here for, right? And then there's also this this task that some of you have already um, been through, but some of you are now um, starting to engage in is how do you even ask a research question? And what would make a research question a critical research question? So first, thinking about pursuing research of importance to the person and community involved. How do you ask questions that people who are actually living these experiences want to know, as opposed to you know, something in the literature or something that, I don't know, the NIMH is calling for a study of. But how do you know that your research and the answers that your questions are going to provide are actually interesting, critical, important um, for, the, for the community themselves? Um, another way to think about critical questions are asking questions across multiple contexts. So making sure that you are engaging context as a, as a driver of how people live their lives and the possibilities for them. Asking questions that decenter whiteness or decenter other dominant identities, heteropatriarchy, middle class identity, ableism, cisgendered identities, etc. So how do your questions engage these explicitly? Asking questions that explore binaries, allow for both ands and complexities in identity, in health, in resilience and risk, in all of these things that we in science so often like to put as binaries, but how do you study the both and? Um, 
asking questions that deconstruct or reveal dominant narratives, and asking a question that confronts power and privilege explicitly. The picture on this slide is, is, uh, is of a book um, that I would encourage those of you who are interested in engaging critical work from the place of a critical question, and they do a good job of talking you through how one might do that. Critical approaches to questions and qualitative research. Also, part of thinking through what's the purpose of my research is getting outside of only producing research for the purpose of publication or your career advancement or the furthering of a field of knowledge. And so Linda Tui Y. Smith and her work came to me at a very particular time in my work where I was um, really struggling with the ways in which I was learning about research and, and what I felt to be a very narrow um, purpose for it. And so these are just some of the other ways in which I would like you to, through the work of Linda Tui Y. Smith's work, Think about how to decolonize research, our own research agendas and make sure that we include and value purposes of our research that might be outside of the more traditional ways of thinking about research as reflaming, as claiming, as testifying, as celebrating survival and healing, as envisioning or revisioning a future for a community or for a person, for storytelling, for connecting and networking, which became a big part of my own uh, dissertation work, for remembering, for revitalizing. So moment two, choosing methods and methodology. So we went over a little bit, some of the methods aspect of framing of the ways in which, you know, we think about critically framing research questions that lead us to places that are critical or lead us to places where our work and our thinking and our research can be more critical. But also it determines the methods and the set of instruments and techniques that you'll use to collect data and to analyze data. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. And also the research method, techniques meaning techniques guiding how research proceeds. How do you collect your uh, data? How do you interview? How do you have a dialogue that can actually be driven by the person that you're in conversation with, as opposed to bringing so many questions of your own that it drives, drowns out the capacity for a person to actually tell you, as was in that scene earlier, I can't possibly quantify how this feels. And then we continue to ask them to do that anyway. Think about here with the kaleidoscope, how does your, how do your methods allow for a kaleidoscope view of life in context? How do you ask questions that have multiple centers that allow people to, at each new interview or each new observation, tell you something different than what someone else told you before? How do you go in and allow for multiple possibilities. And I'm hoping that in our session together, we can talk a little bit more specifically about different methods and ways to do this in our work and the ways in which we oftentimes get so trained um, in the name of good science and rigorous science to, to think more in terms of boxes, squares, and arrows, as opposed to think in terms of kaleidoscope, even though most of our lives are lived not as boxes and arrows, but as myriad different kaleidoscopes. Moment three, lenses of interpretation. This one I like to refer to as the data actually don't speak for themselves. What ends up happening so often in qualitative work, especially when we are hyper attuned to not wanting to oppress voice, is that we do what I would argue is an overcorrection, where we just throw a bunch of quotes at people and assume that the data will speak for themselves. And then that allows us to evade our own role and ethics in being present in the data and being present in disrupting uh, oppressions. And instead, in a critical approach, it invites us to be accountable and transparent to the role that we have played and that we do play in the work that we have done. Part of that journey and doing that ethically requires that you are clear about your own lens and your own positionality as centered in your work and the positionality that the theories you are using centers. And in order to do that, you actually can't let the data speak for, the, for your, themselves because that's the role that you will take as an active agent of disrupting 
um, things like white supremacy or heteropatriarchy, heteronormatism, biocentric understandings of family, et cetera. Because many times folks who you're gonna be interviewing may or may not um, be articulating that expl explicitly. And so I wanna talk with you more about that in our live session, but I wanna just say that and name that here. So considerations of accountability for dominant narratives, tacit theories, or um, explicit theories that are implicit in earlier moments. We talked about doing that in positionality statement, which includes in unpacking not just your identities and positionality statements, um, good ones at least, are not just about sort of confessionals where you say, I am an adopted person or I am, I am not an adopted person or whatever that might be, that list of social identities. But it's also really unpacking what implicit theories and epistemologies, beliefs about certain groups, locations of problems, change, strength, do you bring to this work? What sort of assumptions come because of the skin you're in? What sort of experiences have you had and worldviews do you bring to your work because of who you are? So it really requires us to dig much deeper than kind of superficial listing of identities. But it also invites us to think very explicitly about our use of theory, operationalizing frameworks and constructs as they appear in our work. So viewing people, how do we view people or not as agenic meaning makers, credible knowers? How do we take people um, seriously as having the capacity of being able to art articulate what it's like to be them? How does age inform that and our, and our own willingness to um, invite young people, for example, very, very young people's opinions in on what it's like um, and put that into context, put that into context of what is, what meaning will we make of a five-year-old saying something about their experience versus a 15-year-old versus a 50-year-old. Operationalizing variables that don't position people as solely problems or as deficit framings of difference, to really use complexity and use theories that, that build this in and bake complexity into how they theorize. How do we use anomalies and exceptions rather than throw them out and say, well, that was only just one person <laughs> as though that person doesn't exist. And how do we ourselves do 360 listening? How do our theories and our conceptualizations help us to listen fully to people as whole beings, not just for the literal meanings that they tell us and the words literal meaning, but also for affect, for emotion, for pauses, for what is not said. This is something that some of you who haven't done much positionality work or may have um, gotten through positionality work only through the stage of confessional listings of your identities. This can be helpful for those of you who want to do some kind of peeling off of the onion layering worth around positionalities and interpretive lenses to think through, you know, what is the life context impact that you that is that any of these positionalities have had in terms of the experiences that you have, the privileges, the harms, the oppressions, the gaps in knowledge that you might have, and then what's the personal impact? the internalized meanings. What have you actually internalized about any of these things? So this would be a good time to pause if you would find it useful to go through any of this or just continue on if this is work that you've already done. You can also pause to think about what lenses do you bring to this research? How are you located within the experience of adoption? Are you an adopted person? Are you the sibling of an adopted person? Are you someone who has adopted? Are you a, um, a parent who has um, given up your child for adoption, right? Or lost your child to adoption? Who are you in relationship? Are you all of these things? And what moment of the research process does this most influence for your own work? So take a pause and reflect on those questions. So finally, something that we oftentimes don't talk about in research because it's sort of presumed, particularly for those of us in um, academic spaces, that the dissemination of our work is to a journal, 
to maybe a policy brief or report, and even more recently, maybe tweeting about it, maybe. <laughs> um, but there's a whole wide world out there that we otherwise engage in terms of communicating our findings. And so critical approaches should also engage how we think about disseminating our work. Who is this for and in what form? And that shouldn't be just one person. I, I find it incredibly liberating to see my work published and to be pushing against dominant knowledge in that way. And so I think that that's a really important and valid um, space for critical scholars to be operating in and have presence within. And there are all kinds of other places where we should be taking our work to be thinking about those things that Linda Tuhiwai Smith calls on us to think about in terms of the dissemination of our work um, through testimony, reimagining, connecting, celebrating. There have been times where I have uh, hosted celebrations for research not just because I'm happy to be at that stage of ending, but also as a shared way of um, knowing and teaching and learning and continuing relationship with folks who have been critical in the research process. But again, it asks you to think about who are who is this for? Um, and what is this for? Um, should your findings, what form should your findings take? It could take the form of poetry, of reflective writing, of creative writing, of dance and performance, right? And then I just have this question mark because I teach a class where I just ask my students to just reimagine what are all the different ways in which we produce and share and learn knowledge and why not take work into that form if you are so inclined or talented, right? It also causes us to ask, when should the research end and when does the research end and who gets to decide that? And oftentimes we extract knowledge and then we extract ourselves when we have that knowledge. And that I would argue is a deeply unethical way of engaging a community. And so how might we reimagine relationships in an ethical way, um, in a way that does not um, overly burden and put labor on communities and people for research, but also give some thought to um, ongoing relationships of not knowing and learning and teaching and doing that are socially just. So in the end, critical adoption research in you. Think about your own study. This is, this is some of what we will be doing in our live session together. Who defined your research project? To whom is this study worthy and relevant? Whose knowledge is being built or extended? What are possible positive outcomes? To whom? And go through, because there may be many people that come to mind here. What are the possible negative outcomes to whom? How can the negative outcomes for community, for the community or for the person be eliminated and positive outcomes protected? Or how can they be limited? To whom is the researcher, you, really accountable? And what do you think about that? And how can you have multiple accountabilities? And what processes support the research, the researched and the researcher? Research, as much as we as, as researchers and scientists like to marginalize emotions, research, particularly the closer or more proximal you are to it, is emotional. And it's certainly emotional for people who are engaging, engaged in telling us their stories and their lived experience. And to be thinking about what processes of support are engaged in uh, or built into our research process as part of socially just research. Consider where can your research engage these critical agendas? We talked about the purpose and significance of research, choosing research questions. We've talked about methodology and methods as a critical moment. We've talked about dissemination and content and form and process and timing. And we've also uh, named, we haven't discussed, but we've named, you know, what, is that, what do ethical endings look like? What are transitions that are trauma-informed and healing? Warning, socially just research is challenging to really do this fully. And the more, the more you wade into the deep end of these waters, critical and epistemically just research is often an uphill battle in adoption field, in our adoption field. You sort of are doing 
a million things all at once. You're contesting dominant knowledge and taking for granted truths and theories. You are also arguing against the privilege and bias that that you're met with and that your work is often met with as you speak about it. You have to argue why dominant theories and methods are limited or even harmful, sometimes without benefit of prior literature or prior research, and then assert the knowledge itself. So this is not for the faint of heart. And so I'll leave you with the quote of the day, therefore. Most people say, oops, I'm sorry. Most people say, that it is the intellect which makes a great scientist. They are wrong. It is character. I look forward to meeting each of you. I look forward to learning more about what has the thought that has been triggered by this asynchronous video. And I look forward to being in dialogue with all of you about how we might reimagine a critical research agenda in our field in adoption. Until then, be well.